Hello again. Uh, welcome back. So in today's episode, I'm always curious to learn more about beef, about meat science and all that good stuff, because I think butchery is one of those things that's kind of from the olden days, really, because, I mean, we really don't have our own local butcher shops anymore. Instead, we go to Publix or Walmart or Target or wherever, and we get beef that's usually processed thousands and thousands of miles away. But that's a totally different topic. It's very interesting. But, um, you know, here in the United States, we have a very popular brand, and that's called Angus. You've probably heard about it. Anytime you go to a restaurant or somewhere, you'll probably see like 100% Black Angus or even Red Angus. And so what's the deal with those? Why are they popular? What makes them so great? What makes them so tasty? Well, we're actually going to solve that today. Um, we're chatting with a meat scientist from the Certified Angus Beef brand. Her name is Diana Clark, and she's going to tell us all about the history of the brand, what makes Angus so great, and really kind of what are some more popular cuts of beef that really we don't think about. She does this really cool thing on Instagram, which if you don't follow her, the link will be below. You should follow her. Um, on Instagram, I believe she's Beef Maven, um, but she shares a bunch of different cuts of beef that you might never have heard of. A bunch of really great stuff that is not super common, but tastes delicious. And so we're going to talk about that, kind of her inspiration and how she grew up in the suburbs of Chicago, which, you know, isn't exactly a ranch heavy place and how she went to get her, uh, her, um, her bachelor's and master's degree in meat science in li or I'm sorry, in livestock science, and then eventually became a great butcher and a great scientist at the Certified Beef brand. And so this was awesome, especially, you know, it's 2021, COVID happened last year, it's still kind of happening. Um, and there was a lot of stuff going around last year about like, you know, people were saying there's a, a shortage of beef, when re in reality, there wasn't actually a shortage. Instead, it was kind of like a bottleneck, how there's only like a handful of like kind of big processing plants around the country. And so because of COVID, you know, people were getting sick, uh, workers were um, quitting or leaving. And so we had enough beef, we didn't have a beef shortage, but we had kind of a bottleneck with processing. So that was why um, meat prices kind of skyrocket, skyrocketed and a bunch of other stuff. So we're going to talk about that too. We're going to talk about a bunch of stuff, but here is a quick little clip from my interview with Diana, and she's talking about kind of the background and why exactly the brand Certified Angus Beef was started. So check that out and be sure to listen to the whole episode. I think you'll like it. We had a, fun, a lot of fun talking. Um, so yeah, check it out. Here's a clip. Yeah, so it's really neat the way the way the company started. So we actually had um, there's an Angus farmer that uh, went out to dinner in Chicago. He had a terrible steak, but on the menu it said it was Angus, and he was really upset because he's like, "I raised these Angus animals, and this is what people are eating, and I think that it's Angus beef. This is not Angus beef." So he wrote into the American Angus Association and said, "This is what we need to do in order to make sure that the Angus name is known for known and well liked." Um, and so the American Angus Association said, okay, let's try this. Um, and so they actually got Mick Colvin, um, who lived in West Salem, Ohio. And that's why we are in Worcester, Ohio right now is because of where Mick lived. He said, Mick, you're going to head this up and try to start a branded beef program, which never existed before that. So it's just kind of like, all right, good luck, bud. See you later. Um, but he, he actually got it going. And the main reason why was he was able to work with a meat scientist, Dr. Bob Van Stavern from Ohio State. I actually should say the Ohio State since I'm in the state of Ohio. Gosh, yeah. Um, they play the Ohio State fight song they're little at, at the Cleveland Indians baseball game. I don't, I never understand that. Yeah, I don't get it. I don't get it. I'm still trying to understand that. But anyways, um, so he contacted Dr. Bob Van Stavern to say, hey, we need to to do something to, to make sure that the meat that people are getting is high quality. And so the beauty with Angus animals is that they're already high quality animals in general. I mean, they're just known to be one, they're genetically, they're good mothers. So they're, they're very good at, at producing other cattle and then also just being able to feed and grow and everything. So from a producer standpoint, Angus cattle are awesome. Then from you look from a carcass trait standpoint, they really typically have 
more marbling in them. I mean, they just always have. And you, we've tried to select for this over years. So now we're getting these higher genetics or better genetics, I should say, within the cattle that are producing more marbling within them as well. So then it, that's like the live side of things. But then we look at the carcass. Okay. Now we could say that we want Angus cattle and that's great because then it does drive the demand for the Angus cattle. However, within that group of Angus, I mean, even if you look at, at I, I think about English Mastiff. So I have an English Mastiff dog. You have a wide array of English Mastiff. Usually English Mastiffs are really big animals. Um, they're kind of bold and, and rough. Well, my English Mastiff is only 110 pounds. So very, although it sounds big to some people, that's very light for a Mastiff. Um, she has long hair, doesn't look like your typical Mastiff would, um, but she is technically purebred. I mean, she is a hundred percent Mastiff, English Mastiff. So it's a kind of the same concept with Angus cattle. You can have these Angus cattle that, yeah, they are Angus, but they might've not gotten the best nutrition or they might not have the best genetics. So from an eating quality standpoint, they're still not that great. And so that's where they wanted to say, okay, no, we need to make sure the dots are connected all the way through the system. So they focus on, from the live standpoint, predominantly black hided. And essentially that means the entire body is black. If it has a little white on its face or on its uh, hooves, then it's okay. Uh, but everything else has to be black. So you can have some heterogeneity in there. You can have some mixed breeds because we know commercial herds exist. And that's really the number one thing that's driving that beef industry. So we need to make sure that we play into that. But now let's look at the carcass itself, because that's where the true quality is going to lie in that carcass. And so we'll look at the marbling. We want to make sure that it has enough marbling that a consumer is going to notice a difference. And then we also want to make sure the animal is younger. So less than 30 months of age, because the older an animal gets, the tougher that meat's going to be. So we try to look at those, those things essentially to give that tenderness, juiciness, and flavor, everything that a consumer wants to have in order to ha have a great tasting steak. So that's kind of our goal there. But then we have seven other specifications that we'll look at some other parameters. So some of them we call the chef specs because they look at sizing, having consistent ribeye sizing, little back fat, having a consistent hot carcass weight just to keep the animals more consistent because then they're easier to work with. But then also you don't get excessive in fat. There's not a lot of waste um, in terms of the production standpoint. So it keeps them the more cost effective as well because you don't have to worry about all that trim work and everything. And then you'll have some things that can happen in animals like a capillary rupture or dark cutter or the shape of the ribeye just simply is, is kind of narrow and long. It just doesn't look good. Um, we want to get those out. So kind of they're the oddballs in the industry, but they still exist. And we just don't want those to be in that certified Angus beef box. So once we go through that process, and actually USDA grader is going to evaluate the animal to make sure that it falls into that category, um, it could then be labeled certified Angus beef. So you being a person that would go to a grocery store, and they could go and see that logo, that certified Angus beef logo and say, that's what I'm going to get because all of that guesswork at the end of, does it have enough marbling? Is it going to be tender? How That's all done for you already. So it's making sure that that consumer is going to get the best product that they can find at the store at that time. So that's kind of our goal behind that. And, and doing so, it's going to drive back since we are certified Angus beef, it drives back, oh, that consumer sees Angus and they perceive it as high quality. So it's going to drive that back that demand for the Angus animal, which is going to help our farmers and ranchers get more profit for their animal too. So yeah, again, go check out the episode if you haven't already. It was awesome. Learned a lot from Diana. And if you haven't already, go to thefarmtraveler.com to see all of our awesome episodes all the great podcast stuff that we do, and consider sharing with a friend or family member. And if you're new here on the YouTube channel, subscribe. Um, we're going to do weekly updates on the podcast, stuff like this right here. Um, so yeah, hope you enjoy it, and see you next week. Maybe. Definitely. See you next week. Okay, bye.